This is a chapter three in the Witchery of Archery book by Maurice Thompson. Some notes on woodpecker shooting. The joy is great of him who strays in the shady woods on summer days. With eyes alert and muscles steady, his longbows drawn in his arrows ready. At morn he hears the wood thrush sing, he sees a wild rose blooming. And on his senses soft and low, he feels a brook song ebb and flow. Life is a charm and all is good to him who lives like Robin Hood. Hearing ever, far and thin, hints of the tunes of Gamelin. His greatest grief, his sharpest pain, is when the days are dark with rain, that for a season he must lie, inert while deer go bounding by. Lounge in his lodge, and long and long, for Alan Adale's delightful song, or smack his lips at the thought of one, drink from the friar's demijohn. Back when the sky is clear again, he slouses, slouses grief and forgets his pain, hearing on gusts of charming weather the low laugh of his arrow feather. Flying from a spicewood break or from the maze of the brandles make, well sent to where is hammering the scarlet crowned woodpecker king. Of old so runs a legend of the poets, a beautiful young king of Latinum named Picius went forth into the forest to enjoy his favorite pastime, hunting. We are told he was dressed in a wonderful sporting garb consisting of a splendid purple coat bound at the throat with a zone of gold. Through the dusky pleasant aisles of the woods the young king saw flitting numberless beasts and birds at which, no doubt, he hurled his whizzing cornel shafts as a lusty, sport-loving lord should. Circe, a woman of doubtful honesty, was on this very day going about in the woods hunting for certain herbs known to grow thereabouts, possessing rare properties of great value to dealers in sorcery. Discovering a tuft of the desired weed, I know not whether it was snake root or ginseng, Circe scooped it, stooped and was on the point of sawing it off with a case knife when just beyond a persimmon bush, and munching a pawpaw, she beheld Picius standing up, tall and beautiful, glorious in fine purple, and sheeny with gold. It was on the part of Circe, a case of love at first sight, and with her to love was to speak of it at once. It was leap year, too, so she stuck the case knife in the ground to mark the place where the ginseng grew, if it was not snake root, and stalking up to the king, proposed right off. He spurned her offered caresses indignantly, whereupon she slashed him across the head with the club that she held in her hand, to such an effect that withhold, forwith he was transformed into a bird to which the day we call the picus, the woodpecker. I have often undered, wondered if the wand of Circe did not fetch the blood from the crown of the head of the picus, for how else can we explain the origin of the red spot? that ever-present and unmistakable mark of the real American woodpecker family. From the demure and quiet sapsucker up through all of the species of the great black woodpecker, this blotch of red blood feathers is found. A mere dot in the case of the smallest species, it spreads all over the head of the white-tailed variety and rises into a magnificent scarlet plume crown on that of the Hylotmus Pil pilcatus. You'll have to for, forgive my pronunciation. To me, the woodpeckers are the most interesting of all the American small birds. I never tire of studying them. Obtrusive, inquisitive, bellicose, knavish, self-important, dishonest, and noisy beyond compare. The white-tail variety is perhaps the most versatile genius of the woods. He attempts everything with an air of the most presuming impertinence, and in fact, the only thing he really cannot accomplish in the way of attainment generally thought necessary to a well-educated and cultured bird, is simply to sing a good song. Even his love note is a sort of rasping squawk, sounding like, Squeer! 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 Repeatedly and definitely. I once saw a great horned owl perch itself on the stub of a broken limb of a decayed tree just below the hole in which a woodpecker had its nest. It was after nightfall, and the moon was directly behind the owl for me, bringing it into bold relief, the huge bird's outlines. Occasionally, the woodpecker, doubtful afraid for its young, darted out of the hole to give the owl 
a peck and retreated instantly within. It must be a quick arrow that hits a white-tailed woodpecker. He is a consummate dodger, flipping himself around a tree or behind a fence stake as quick as thought as the sound of your bowstring. See that one yonder on the on that slender stump? His back is fair and he looks as though a line had been drawn across his middle and then he would have been printed, painted white below it and black above with a dash of fiery red for a head. He is only 25 yards away. Try him with a light pewter headed arrow. You pull very steady and strong. Loosing evenly and sharply. Away darts your shaft. Whack! With a blow on the stump exactly where the bird was, but too late to get him. He heard your bow standing, and quick as a flash, he slid around behind his stump. And when the arrow struck, he flew away. See, now he is on a horizontal branch of an oak situated about 25 feet up the trunk. I will take a shot at him. Watch now. Twang! Hiss! See him swing around and hang back downward under the limb as the arrow darts above. Too quick for me. Wait a moment. We'll try him with this slender, narrow, feathered arrow, which has the merest drop of hand so hard solder for a head. You draw on him with great care and let drive. Ha! Center shot. And down he comes. That shaft is a little too swift for his dodging. He is your bird. There are several kinds of woodpecker misnamed sapsuckers by our people. The speckled bird of the southern pine forest, nearly allied with the picus pursuit, uh, oh, the downy woodpecker, <laughs> our great northern states is generally called a sapsucker by the southern people. While two varieties of the hairy woodpecker and the downy woodpecker, and the Centaurus carolinus, or the true sapsucker, all go by that one name, sapsucker. In all the northern states, these birds are quite tame as a rule and fall easy victims to the expert archer. But you'll never, but you will shoot a long while before you hit even the foolish little speckled fellow that bores holes in your apple trees. It is amusing to watch a sapsucker after he's made ring after ring of pits around an apple, a cedar, or a maple tree, go his rounds from one to another to all these holes, sipping the nectar. Therefrom, seeming to enjoy in the most satisfactory way this liquid fruit of his toil. Meanwhile, keeping a lively lookout for an enemy. He is a good mark, but as soon as you have learned to hit him, I would advise you to seek nobler game. He is a pretty little fellow, and growing quite, quite rare in many loca localities. The yellow-bellied woodpecker is everywhere to be seen in the woods. He is, together with hairy and downy varieties, furnish me... Many days of rare sport before I could claim the right to be called an expert archer. But by far, the noblest bird of the Pickus family in the United States is a great American black woodpecker, which has disappeared already from the western woods and is becoming rare even in the vast forests to the south. When at rest, his body appears quite black. His head has whitish stripes above the eye and is surmounted by a long tuft of brilliant scarlet feathers. When he takes the flight, which he does with great vigor, at the least alarm, his wings show a sprinkling of white, which he, which relieves the dusky hue of his body. The bird is at present most numerous in the mixed forests of oak and pine in the hill country of East Tennessee, North Georgia, and North Alabama. It was in Gordon County, Georgia, while yet new-fledged archers from the school of the Hermit of the Will, that Will and I bagged our first specimens of the great woodpecker king. It was the most exciting bout in the woods of the hilly divide between the valley of the Ogallatha and that of the Ostanula, two streams whose confluence is a mile west of the town of Calhoun on the Western and Atlantic Railroad, on which excursion we killed their three specimens, the finest I ever saw. It was in December, clear, cool weather, a little hazy, none, not unlike our northern Indian summer, and scarcely a breath of wind. Early in the morning, we entered the woody outskirts of the Divide, and were not long in finding two black woodpeckers whose loud pounding reached our ears from several hundred yards distance. They were on an old log, the stem of a fallen pine tree, busily engaged in pecking holes in search of the larva of ants, 
or the white sawworms which infest dead pine wood. At that time, we were armed with mulberry longbows of our own make and arrows too heavy and clumsy for first-rate shooting. But we were full of confidence and as enthusiastic as boys could be. We let fly from the cover of a pine thicket at 40 yards, making a clear miss of it, but frightening the birds terribly. Their flight was short, however, and on one of them, not knowing whence the arrows had come, lit on a post oak sapling scarcely 20 yards from our thicket. Will drew quick quickly and let him have a blunt arrow, but it struck too far back, only breaking one of his thighs and sending him off on a crazy winding flight. Securing our arrows, we gave chase. Now the sport began in good earnest. The bird would belong to whichever could give him the death shot. I fear, if I tell you that for two hours we raced after that bird, shooting at it somewhere near a dozen times each, before at last we bolted over. You will smile at our archery, but if you try it before your smile broadens into a laugh, will you, and report the result? It may seem to you an easy feat to hit a bird at nearly, at nearly as large as a crow at 20 or 30 yards, but I assure you it requires no little skill to do it, and you must remember we were beginners. I had the pleasure of bagging the second bird by a shot, no doubt somewhat up by, of an accident. I have rarely equaled and striking it with a barbed arrow, the shaft of which with a slender reed or cane at the distance of 60 yards. The third bird was knocked from a pine stump at 30 yards by Will. Of course, in the meantime, we missed a great many shots, our arrows flying surprisingly wide of our astonish or astonishingly close to our intended victims. By at first being Content with practicing on woodpeckers and metal arcs, the beginner in arch wildwood archery will soon get by heart the primer of woodcraft. The half of a successful bow hunting of game depends entirely upon the archer being able to approach to within easy range of his object without being discovered. He will soon take on all the cunning, caution, slyness, alertness, quickness, and si silentness of an Indian or a cat. The following simply the following simple rules will be found when mastered to afford the perfect knowledge of small bird shooting. Use light, narrow feathered arrows with very blunt pewter heads. Pointed shafts will stick into the trees and remain out of reach. For a description of the method of making bird arrows, see the appendix. A birding arrow should be light and of not over 50 pound drawing power, as it must be hauled quickly handle quickly and under all sorts of difficulties, such as interfering brambles and brushwood, awkward positions, etc. The quiver should be large enough to hold at least a dozen arrows and should be so well secured up to the belt that it will not rattle when you walk. Shoot short distances at first and pay strict attention to where your arrow goes or it will be lost. Glance over the ground between you and your bird before shooting and in your mind measure the probable distance in yards. When you have shot, note whether you have shot over, under, beside the bird, so that you may rectify the fault with the next shot. Use arrows of but one length and weight, and draw each one to the head, thereof in shooting, whether the bird be near or far. Do not grow discouraged if, your first, if at first your arrows fly wide of the object. Keep trying. Creep closer to your birds and shoot coolly and deliberately. Never be nervous or excited. Remember that you are learning the alphabet now. Presently, all will be easy. Carry in a convenient pocket a notebook and pencil, which you keep a record of your progress, and such naturalistic observations as may seem worthy of preserving. When a bird is hit, note just how you drew, aimed, and loosed, and try to repeat the success. It is only by intelligent watchfulness and perseverance that perfect shooting is reached. Let us now have a bout after larger birds in one of the charming hunting places of the far south. Chapter 4. Bow Shooting on the St. John's All day long we had been going at a snail's pace on the brown placid surface of the St. John's River. Not infrequently a having to resort to the oars to help our sh shoulder of mutton sail out of the dead calm. 
The sky was clear, and the sun had been shining with a power that was not usual even in Florida, which connected with the fact that we had not seen a live thing since morning. A few ducks flying overhead accepted. Had made the time wear slowly away, and it was a feeling of a pleasant relief just as the moon was beginning to struggle with the twilight, we turned into a lazy little creek between high walls of trees and by a short run found a fine camping place on the south bank. Caesar, ever on the watch to do something clever, had stowed away in the boat's little hold, had stowed away in the boat's little hold a pile of pine knots. With some of these, he soon started a bright fire, by the light of which we pitched our tent made ready for the night. Will and I oiled and rubbed our bows and assorted our supply of arrows for the morrow's sport, while Caesar broiled some bacon and a large trout for our supper, bass, for our supper. The moon, though but a crescent, shone brightly through the open places, but our tent was in a place of dense shade, and our flaring fire did fantastic work as it dashed its tricksy light amongst the gear, great tree trunks, vines, and pendant mosses as it shot across the creek in a long tapering finger in long tapering fingers that caressed in a weird way the tall aquatic grasses and the matted lily pads. Just the fainted swishing sound come up from the borders of the stream to mingle with the voice of the pines, a clump of which crowned a little swell in the southward. Overhead mighty live oaks spread their boughs, hung here and there with long curtains of grey Spanish moss. How hungry one gets with a few hours fast in the open air, said Will, munching a cracker. How delightfully aggravating the smell of the broiling bacon. I believe this sort of life has a tendency to make an animal of a man. Why, it's all I can do to restrain an impulse now to whinny for my food like a hungry horse. And the coffee, too, said I, feeling fascination at the subject. And the coffee, too, sends out the most persuasive odor. Caesar rolled his big white eyes in our direction and suggested that, as for him, he was literally starving for a baked possum. Broiled bacon was a snare and a delusion, and fish was dry food at best. We all did ample honor to the supper, however, and, and after a pipe we sought rest. Caesar and Will took to their respective places in the tent, but I swung my hammock between two trees, and as was my custom, placed my bow and quiver alongside me. My big hound, brought with me from Jacksonville, came and curled himself up in a tight knot right underneath me, and was soon snoring away the most resonantly, resonantly. The breeze, which had freshened a little since dark, was strong enough now to blow away the few mosquitoes, and I soon fell into a sweet sleep. With a cluster of stars looking down at me through a rift in the dense mask of vines and foliage above, Indeed, so calm and refreshing, refreshing was my slumber that it seemed like I scarcely dozed when I was startled by a terrible rush made by the dog, the noise of which mingled with the failing, falling of the tent and some profound anathemas by Will and Caesar as they struggled out from under the collapsed canvas. I snatched my bow and quiver and leaped to the ground just as the hound began to whine most piti pitifully in the bay thicket a few yards away. An animal of some sort was punishing him severely, and the peculiar cry of a catamount at bay left no doubt as to what it was. The tent had been hastily and insecurely pitched, and the dog making his rush at the cat had brought it down about the ears of my companions. Snuffing a smell of fun in the air, I sprang to my rubber boots, buckled on my quiver and pistol, and strung my bow in much less time than it takes to ride it. I was splashing through the water in the direction of the dog, which is now baying loudly, evidently keeping at a respectful distance from his enemy. When I had almost reached the spot, they made another break, and away they went, the dog mouthing broadly at every jump, making the sober old woods ring with the, stifling, with the stirring music. I tore after them through the slush and brush, cheering them lustily. Will and Caesar followed and I could tell by their loud shouts a run of a half a mile brought me up with the hound. I found him barking and snapping savagely at the center of a circular tuft of water bushes on the top of a clump of which I saw the catamount in a crouching attitude, his eyes flaming, its hair erect, 
and his claws spread. The very picture of fury. I was within 40 feet of it, and I was aware of the fact. I recoiled before the glare of the fierce eyes. The animal really looked twice its natural size. My nerve came to me in a moment, however, and I hastily made ready for a shot, fixing a broadhead arrow to the string. I centered my gaze full in the face of the cat, and I drew steadily till I felt the barb touch my left knuckle. This told me I had put the weight equal to 80 pounds, and then I let go. I know, And no doubt was I a little excited, but I did not make a bad shot. The arrow struck the animal's ear, cutting across the back of its neck, and passed through the point of its shoulder. You have seen a flying squirrel spread itself out thin as a bit of buck skin and sail slowly off from the top of a tree. Well, like a huge flying squirrel, wounded, infuriated, and terrible, that catamount transformed itself into a monster, but bat, and sailed right out into the air towards me. I shall never forget the appearance of the thing's eyes as it shot level along the tops of those scruffy little trees, somewhat lower than my head. Of course it fell short of me, but for the second or two it reminded, remained in the air, I was sure it would strike me full in the face. And it crashed down through the bush, I took to my heels <laughs> and fled ignobly until I gained an open space. The dog followed me with the huge cat charging at its heels. I let go another shaft, but my haste made a clear miss. The hound, emboldened by my stand, turned now and began snapping at its pursuer. At this moment, Will reached the ground and lodged an arrow in the cat's flank while it was so close to me that I shot it twice with my pistol, being able to, unable to use my bow. The dog gave it a yank or two, and Will got another arrow in about the middle of its long body. This weakened it somewhat and gave me a chance to make a center drop with a point round point right between its shoulder. Caesar rushed in at this juncture and closed the tragedy by a few tremendous blows with a long pine knot. Although the catamount was an enormous one, I'm surprised, however, I think of the sturdy fight he made. After a few moments given to the discussing of the battle, Caesar proceeded to get up a light and skin our victim, while a big owl hooted a doleful requiem and a dense jungle of cypress and rubber hard by. When we returned to camp, we were too much stirred up to sleep, and we had an early breakfast, and by the first glimmer of daylight, we went about heading our boat up the creek. By 10 o'clock, we'd reached a little lake covering, some hundreds of acres, rimmed around by live oaks, and here, and cypress there, and dotted with lettuce islands and stretches of lily pads. We saw a large number of great and snowy herons flapping about in the distance, a few great blue herons, and many of the lesser fry of the same interesting family. I had never killed a snowy heron, nor had Will, and this little expedition had been fitted up for the purpose of bagging some. We had boasted to a friend or two that we should never return till we came well loaded with plumes. Few persons, not sportsmen or naturalists, and fully understand the particular difficulty of her self-imposed task. Even an excellent woodsman, and a trained sportsman as though he be, and armed to the best firearms, can rarely, by any cunning, get within long range of these beautiful birds. How much more difficult then for us, armed with these long-since discarded weapons of antiquity, to approach the wary game. But the apparent improbability of our succeeding made the undertaking the more attractive, and we loved our weapons. It was, and had all confidence in our craft and marksmanship. We had brought two small sectional skiffs with us, just large enough to bear one man. In these, we, pr we proposed to offer battle to the snowy herons. We found a delightful camping spot near the southeastern shore of the lake, and here we pitched our tent, and also constructed a large shed of open or open lodge, which we thatched with palmetto, palmetto leaves. Over this camp, we left Caesar to rail supreme and having made everything ready we put out early the, early the second morning each in a skiff with a day's rations and a full case of light barbed arrows and a dozen or so of the heavy broadheads we took different courses mine lay to the northeast of our camp up the arm of the lake which had received a sluggish run of runlet 
across the mouth of which, in a very shoal water, a huge mass of lettuce had drifted. On either hand, some tall old cypress trees stood with their knees just above the water, and a little further west, a stretch of great aquatic weeds ran out in a narrow line parallel with the shore, leaving just enough channel to receive my skiff. At this place I anchored, finding the water only four feet deep in the middle. I quietly settled my theory for shooting herons, and was about to test it by a practical experiment. On the day before, I had noticed that two fine snowy fellows made it convenient to light on a certain bare dead tree about 60 yards distance from where I had thus stationed myself. This they had done so often and regularly that I suspected had established their resting place and point of lookout midway to their, of their flight from one extremity of the lake to the other. I hoped that shielded by the line of tall grass and weeds to get a shot or two. I lay down in my skiff with my head resting on a roll of moss and having lit a pipe, contentedly waited and watched. A pleasant breeze was sweeping the lake, making a soft rustle in the weeds, while over in the woods a little way, a cardinal bird, so seldom seen in Florida, was singing a shrill, cheery song. So sweet it was to rest there, with the wind pouring over me and the water washing under, that I cared little about the snowy hair and ever flew my way or not. I was absorbing health and dreamful bliss through every pore of my body and the blue wreath from my pipe as I floated upward and away, ring after fading ring, were enough to engage my whole attention. But presently a small alligator thrust his ugly snout out of the water hard by and a big moccasin snake glided along the slimy edge of the weeds. Then a snake bird, a foul funny biped, dropped into the shoal coffee-like liquid of a miniature lagoon, twisting himself into a thousand ludicrous contortions till he looked like nothing but a neck tied into a double bow knot. Once I saw fairly far across what seemed leagues of sheeny, shiny, sheeny water, a young deer scarcely small enough to be called a fawn, slip like a shadow through the opening and disappear. The merest hint of what the forest might hold, now and then a swell from the lake, which the breeze had shaken up, came round in my retreat and rocked me gently, as if the happy water with its fingertips was barely able to reach me. Sparrowhawks wheeled about overhead, giving out their particular cry, and a little green-winged warbler lit the feathery tip of grass leaf, balancing himself adroitly, rocking to and fro with his quizzical eyes turned down at me, twi twittering all the time a mock. Mon a monotonous round of three or four notes. Somewhere in a far recess, of course, a big owl with a voice that reviled, reviled the lowest possible register was doing a solo that ended in a wild, maniacal laugh. I lay there for perhaps two hours, reviling in the, rev reveling in the quietest of all contentment, and was aroused at last by a snowy heron flying so low and so near me that I fancied that I felt the air wafted from his broad-spreading wings, the satin-like sound of which filled my ears with music. I could have killed him on the wing had I been ready, but there I lay, my bow unstrung, and there I lay stretched out on, in my boat. I got myself rapidly and noiseless, noiselessly into position and strung my bow. As I had hoped, the bird rose as he neared one of the dead trees and alighted with a high broken branch, making it quiver with his weight. I had a fair view of him through the notch-like rift in the wall of grass and weeds and was actually trembling with excitement. I drew to the head and let fly. What a wild shot! The arrow sang through the air high above him, missing him fully <laughs> ten feet. Contrary to my fears, he did not take to his wing but simply turned his head over to the side and glanced at the arrow as it passed. He did not dream of my proximity. Again I let go, this time cutting the air close to his beautiful neck. He jerked his head but did not move a wing. What a glorious weapon the longbow is. I must say and say it often and urge it strenuously that this is the most delightful of the sporting implements. There I was within 60 or 80 yards of a great snowy heron, with two shots at it, and st it still sat there. 
What if I'd been armed with a rifle? The first shot would have frightened the game into a spasm of flight. But there he sat, all unconscious of me till I shot twice, thrice, four, five. The arrows whizzing past, tipping the outmost down of his feathers and rounding over to drop with a sharp duck into the lake beyond. My arm had gone steady now, and I drew my sixth arrow with great confidence, my eyes fixed on the butt of the great bird's right wing. It was shot to the delight of the gods. The dull re recoil sound of my bow was followed by a quick whisper, and then a dead solid blow, a chuck once heard never forgotten. The feathers puffed out and sailed away slowly in a widening ring. The big wings opened wide and quivered a moment. Then the grand old fellow toppled, o toppled over and came straight down with a loud splash into the water. I yelled like a savage. I couldn't help it. It stirred me to the core. I hastily weighed my little anchor, but none too soon, where I saw two alligators with their rusty noses out of the water striking out for my bird. If ever a man made a skiff fly, I did that one. The very thought of losing my bird infuriated me. I reached it first, and the alligator began swimming around in a circle. I gave one of them a bodkin point in the throat, causing him to turn some wonderful somersaults and then to beat the water into a stiff foam. I lifted my snowy heron into the skiff. It was a magnificent bird, full-plumed and in perfect health. It was now noon, and feeling hungry, I rode to the palmetto point a quarter of a mile east and went ashore to broil a slice of bacon. I had just started a little fire of palm leaf stems when Will joined me, having seen me land. He had killed a young swamp rabbit, which we dressed and roasted, finding a most toothsome bit. My bird was too much for Will. He stripped aside from one of the wing feathers and bounded it into an arrow, a token of a vow not to leave the lake till, we had, till he, too, had bagged a snowy heron. I frankly told him that if he stuck to his vow, I thought he would live to be 80 and die on the lake without accompanying his very sportsmanlike desire. <laughs> After a rest of two hours, we again separated, each choosing his way and going off to full of dreams of the snowy heron. But I got into a raft of duck and came near shooting away a whole case of arrows at them with miserable luck, only killing five. I returned to camp before sundown, finding Caesar light, light, highly delighted. He's seen a flock of wild turkeys. I set him to work immediately, skinning my bird, a thing he could do to perfection. Will came in after dark with a rail and two or three beautiful wood ducks, but no heron. He was gone the next morning before I was awake. As for me, when I was awake, I did not get up or rather down, but lay there swinging in the breeze, caring for nothing but comfort. I made Caesar bring me a cup of coffee and my pipe. I hung over the sides of my hammock and sipped the rich brown beverage till its cheering effects tingled in my every nerve from lip to toe. Then I let fall the cup and took the pipe to smoke off the influence of the coffee. I dropped asleep again with another between my lips. Sometime later I was startled by Caesar, who began the loud shouting of a sudden oh looky looky he's after him he'll get him sire looky looky gully key looky mare mars he's after him jerusalem but don't pull don't he pull that boat for dolores sake that's just as good as his bird right now looky looky the excited negro was prancing about like one possessed pointing out at the lake as it needed but a glance for what he meant there midway in the rippling sheet of water was Will in full chase of a snowy heron, which was evidently very sorely wounded. I had only to lie there and watch the sport. The bird, which, as I afterwards learned, had been stricken through the wing between the bones without breaking either, held out bravely, flapping along the water at a good round rate of speed. Will would row a while, then dropped the oars and shoot. Finally, he bolted over and dragged it into a skiff. As I expected, he yelled like a steam whistle as soon as he handled his bird. I took another cup of coffee and was sound asleep again when he came in. His prize was not so large as mine, but his plumage was even finer. In the afternoon, having caught up my lost sleep, I pulled out again and had some rare luck. 
for although I did not even see a white heron, I killed a blue one of enormous size and made a charming shot, knocking over a black woodpecker from a skiff high up in the boughs of a pine tree on shore. I believe I am not the first observer to remark the singular fact that all the wild birds at times suddenly, and it might be said mysteriously, congregate in a particular spot, irrespective of species or order. In a western forest, for example, one may at an hour of day range up and down without seeing a feather or hearing a note. The trees are deserted, the underbrush is abandoned. A few minutes or hours later, the same region will be alive with an almost countless variety of birds, small and large. Standing in one spot, the observer may count half a dozen different kinds of woodpecker. The blue jays will scream, the flycatchers, the nuthatches, the thrushes, the wrens, the warblers, the finches, the cardinal birds, bluebirds, robins, and the chewinks, and on through the catalog. It will all be visible and audible, appearing so suddenly that one half decides that all of them have an one impulse sprung from the hiding places there on the spot. So it happened late in the afternoon that I slowly pushed my skiff through the sinuous waves of lily pads and stiff water weeds. All at once there came a storm of birds, first a flock of ducks, then a line of cranes, a small flock of geese next, and then I could not count what I saw. Herons labored through the way, this way and that, scop ducks whiffle, whistled through the air, and little buffalo heads went by like gaily feathered darts. Gannets and curlews displayed their long wings and contrasting colors as they sped past, while all about in every direction little rails and still smaller aquatic birds flitted among the rushes and stood as if on tiptoe atop the bonnets. Wood ducks whose gorgeous beauty swam in their dainty but stately way across the dimly shaded avenues below the pendant air plants. And now and then, bright, trim teal would cut through the water like a sword from one clump, clump of brush to the other. The bass, too, as if catching the prevailing spirit of the hour, leaped up among the pa amongst the pads, making the small fry spin in every direction. Narrow-winged hawks shot hither and thither, turning their heavy heads from side to side, and little flocks of snipe whirled down into the pl small prairie of the southward. Right in the midst of this confusion of game, I met Will in his skiff, emerging from one of these dim little lanes of water that everywhere set out in the forest from the lake. He'd killed a small turkey hen and had a lively run after it, clipping it through the very center of its lungs. He was mud from head to foot. One would think that we ought to have had some extraordinary sport during the hour of daylight that has now remained for us, but through our part of the lake was thus teeming with game. The birds were so watchful so cautious and shy that all kept cleverly beyond bow range. We wasted many arrows on promising wing shots, but it may as well be understood that hitting a flying bird with an arrow is more than accident is more like accident than admirable skill. To be sure, a grouse or a crane at thirty yards is not difficult to bring to a stop, but it is only the rarest chance that one gets such an opportunity. Occasionally we started to raft a duck with weed from the weed circle pond at arrow slung at random through the thickest of the flock would send back to our cars the short sudden sound of a hit or send back to our ears the short sudden sound of a hit and the victim strung midway of the shaft would come whirling down to beat the water a moment with his wings and die much oftener however our missiles would by some inexplicable maneuver find their way through the dense mass of the flock without so much as tipping a feather. Once a half a dozen gannet came around a point of the woods flying very low, we were right upon us before they saw us and we saw them. They turned suddenly with a loud sound of wings. But Will, who had a shaft ready, let fly, hitting one a dead blow a mid-breast, bringing him to a short stop and settling him, settling him beautifully. This ended our luck. We shot and shot, but hit nothing, Finally, Weary and Armsor pulled back to camp, on arriving which we found Caesar, the most woebegone and disconsolate negro in the world. Somehow he had let the tent get on fire and burn up, together with our box of crackers. Fortunately, however, he had saved our bird skins and our chemicals. Poor fellows, his eyes were wonderfully enlarged and he had severely burned one of his hands, 
but when he saw that I was not offended, he brightened up and got us a good supper, barring the lack of bread. We lingered on the lake for two weeks longer, after having sent Caesar to the landing on the St. John's, where from a passing steamer he succeeded in getting a keg of hardtack. One day, divided by will to feathering a lot of the shafts, I got out of my fishing tackle to try the bass or trout, as we southerners call them. Of course, I took my bow and my case of arrows along, but my object was to test some flies of my own make. Direct, directly across the lake from the camp, and at the mouth of a little run, was a place that seemed to be just the feeding ground for trout, a most delightful spot in which to have a dream away half a day with rod and line. I was not prepared for all the result of my excursion. Never have I seen such voracious, such utterly rapacious fish. I spun out my fly, dropping it between the lily pads, and I think it only half touched the water when a trout, a black bass, took it like a steel trap, and hanging himself thoroughly, showed fight from the start. He fouled my line at once, and then began a series of gymnastic feats in the water and out of it that made a great circle of bubbles and foam at the rippling surface. I finally had to shoot him, and lost a full half an hour disengaging my line. I now saw that I must give my game no line, and forthwith I began to haul in on a short pull till 19 average 3 pounds each lay in the bottom of my skiff. There were as many as we could use at camp, so I desisted, but I'm sure I could have taken many more. If the water had been free of bonnets, brush, roots, and lettuce, and what not obstructions, the sport would have been delightful. On my way back to camp, I made a shot a rifleman might equal but never excel. Seeing a male wood duck of magnificent plumage swim across a little opening and dart under some great drooping aquatic leaves, I circled around the spot till I saw his bright head shining through a small circular rift not larger than the palm of one's hand. I was standing in my skiff, pushing it through the shoal water by pulling with an oar, and I had to put down the ladder to string my bow. Doing this, I lost sight of the rift. No one but a sportsman knows the difficulty in discovering such a mark once lost. I looked with all my eyes, to no effect. There were pads in the lush, and the lush, no word like lush, grass leaves, and the overhanging water bushes, but the rift was gone. It must have been fully fifteen minutes time I spent puzzling over the mysterious disappearance. Then for a moment a hark, hawk darting by called my eyes away. And on looking again, lo, there was the rift, and there was my wood duck's head, plain as could be. How I could have overlooked it even for a moment... So intent was I on making the shot that I did not notice I selected a broad-headed arrow. Balancing myself in the skiff, I drew a full 28 inches and let go. No knife could have cut that duck's head in two at the eyes more, more nicely than did that arrow. The distance was almost 60 feet. Broiled trout for supper and a song from Caesar, then Will and I discussed our, the merits of our plan for a night visit to the little prairie about a mile distance. In the marshy places of which we had seen numer numerous tracks of deer, the moon was now a little past the full, just struggling up in the east. It would be almost as light as the day. By the time I had finished my pipe, we had determined to go. Quivers are buckled on and filled with select arrows, rubber boots donned, and the march commenced. I lashed the hound to my belt, contrary to Will's judgment, and made him follow at my heels. I calculated that we would need him, and calculated correctly. True, he was rather unmanageable at first, and bent on flying off the tangent whenever we crossed the trail of the wild thing. But by dint of coaxing, scolding, the last sound and at last a sound beating, I sub subdued him. The prairie reached, I took my stand in the dusky shadow of a clump of palms near what I seemed a favorable, favorable run, while Will beat stealthily around the edge of the opening, which was about 20 acres in extent and fringed for most of its perimeter with dense jungle. Making the hound crouch at my feet, I leaned on my bow and while waiting developments, gave myself up to the enjoyment of the scene. The landscape was one of singular weirdness, every feature strangely affected by the oblique rays of the moon. In some places on the further walls of the woods, the long moss looked the long moss looked like festins of pale gold, while at others it was dusky almost to blackness. 
swinging across dim openings like the deadly snares of some night monster. Near and in the strong light, graceful vines and air plants in full flower let fall with their airy sprays set in a rugged framing of gnarled branches and twisted trunks. The silence was utter. Not even an owl was heard. The grassy stretch of the little prairie dotted here and there with palms, singularly air in clusters. Standing out singularly sharp made one think of pictures of the far east, that old land of palms and ruins. Now and then, as I would get a glimpse of Will gliding noiselessly along the border, his bow in his left hand and an arrow in his right, and his quiver at his side, the picture became a perfect antique underscored with snatches from the old poets. Suddenly, through the stillness and silence, from a dark angle of the border, the particular muffled sound of a bow's recoil, distinctly the thin hiss of a flying arrow, ended with a deadly thud. I raised my bow and listened. The hound gave out a sharp whine and was eager to be off. I kicked him down and then I plainly heard the noise of bounding feet, Will pursuing something. The next moment I saw a deer coming at the slashing run right across me. In a second I loosed the dog and he parted from me like a bolt, meeting the deer abreast and dragging it to the ground within ten steps of me. But it shook him off and gained a jungle before I could fix an arrow. The hound followed. The yell from Will attracted my attention, and looking out in the prairie, I saw him racing after another deer, in, in whose head I could distinctly see an arrow. The animal, blinded and crazy from an oblique shot in the eye, was rearing and plunging this way and that, while Will was evidently trying to get a hold of it. Run here! Oh, run here quick! I've lost my quiver! Quick, quick! He shouted, slashing around after the game with the energy of a desperation. I gave a few shrill blasts with my whistle for the dog, and then ran out to join in the chase. As soon as I was near enough, I drove an arrow into the animal's body, but this seemed rather to bring it to life rather than otherwise. For now it suddenly sped off on a straight line. The dog came up just in time and overtook it, dragging it down at the edge of the jungle and holding it till I put an arrow through its heart. Will was exhausted. The deer, two of them, had stepped right out into the edge of the prairie within 20 feet of him. He shot hurriedly and hit one in the head, knocking it clear over. Running up to it, he took hold of the foreleg to turn it on its back, thinking to cut its throat when it began to struggle, and in some way broke his quiver belt so that his arrows fell to the ground. Then it dragged him some distance and finally freed itself. He followed it bow in hand for some time, knowing that the loss of his quiver, not knowing of the loss of his quiver, thus discovered he could not go back in to hunt it, so he followed the deer on, hoping to get hold of it again. He had to acknowledge that my hound was not, also, was not so bad after all. We found his quiver after a short search, then tying the deer's feet together and swinging it on a pole, we lugged it into camp. As we trudged along with our game hanging between us, all bristling with arrows, I fancied we looked like a couple of foresters in the merry days of Richard Kilorder, Richard the Lion, say Friar Tuck and Robin Hood, making preparations for a feast. When a time came for us to bid farewell, to our little lake, Will and Caesar volunteered to pull the boat down to the stream by which we had entered, allowing me to follow at leisure in my skiff. It was early morning, and feeling that some vigorous exercise would not hurt me, I pulled around the circle of the lake's shore, snatching some farewell shots and complimenting some sketches of water plants, in which I had been greatly interested. While pulling my way through a sort of elbow thicket, I discovered a very singular-looking bird skulking about under some long arc arcing blades of water grass. It had much the appearance of a wood duck, but out of the center of its back, at an angle of about 45 degrees, a strange appendage tipped with a tuft of bright scarlet feathers protruded in an unnatural way. The motion of the bird was awkward in the extreme, and it seemed that it had been about with an utmost effort that it moved at all. I bowled it over with a second shot, and on securing it found it was nothing but a wood duck after all with one of Will's light barbed arrows worn in its back for ornament. The shaft had been in the wound several days. It is one of the particularities of the true archer that when he shoots at anything in the shape of a bird or wild animal that presents itself with him, all fish is game in the broadest sense. Having a bunch of light arrows with me. I've been begun practicing on red-winged blackbirds 
that now and then perched within easy shot on the bonnets of the lilies. And so utterly oblivious to everything else that I did, I become like it was being startled from a dream when a great blue heron sprang heavily into the air from a little tussock in the middle of a clump of water-growing shrubs, not more than 25 feet of me. My arm was in good training, however. Instinctively, I let fly at him just as he made a half turn and poised himself for a vigorous sweep. The light arrow struck him somewhere about the thigh and remained stiffly sticking in the wound. The huge bird whirled over and over a few times, then mounted perpendicularly through the air. Up, up, up he went. I lost two or three unsuccessful, unsuccessful shafts after him, but he heeded them not. Right up he struggled by a narrow spiral course till he began to rapidly diminish in apparent size. And finally, after flickering indistinctly in the sky for a time, he utterly vanished. But this was not all. Several minutes afterwards, the headless shaft of the arrow came whirling back down and fell near me. It had been broken off close to the brazing, and it was quite bloody. Where did that stricken powerful bird go to? Did he continue to mount till suddenly exhausted he fell with outstretched wings through a long incline into a merciful bosom of some wild everglade? Or did he go up until his piercing eye discovered that the paradise of birds where no archer ever lies in wait? No matter. I lost a beautiful tuft of plumes by his energy and pluck. I lingered on the lake long enough after the happy minstrel song of Caesar ceased its echoing, or if it or if heard at all, did so distinctly in the distance that it might have been taken for wind tones in the vine-clad live oaks. I was loath to leave the spot. It was an archer's paradise. It might have been a gunner's paradise, too, if fouling pieces could have been used without noise. But in one day's sport with a double barrel on that little lake would have frightened everything away, excepting perhaps the snake birds and the alligators. Fifty bowmen, even if they could kill as much game as that as many sportsmen with shotguns, would not in two weeks' time drive off the, and render unapproachable the featherless tribes of a choice hunting spot, which would be completely cleaned by one man with a blunderbuss in a single day. The sound of a gun is a terror to all wild things except fowl. I'm ready to admit that. During our somewhat protracted sojourn on the lake, we did not take with our weapons half so much game as either one of us could have alone taken with a good gun. But we took enough, and the sport was far better than that could be had in any other way, unless the mere destruction of game is sport. Many days passed during which we did not bend our bows at all, but lay in our skiffs and watched the habits of birds and reptiles, and filled our books with sketches of curious plants, trees, birds, insects, and whatever seemed worth a study. We were troubled very little with mosquitoes, and there were but a few over warm days, while the nights were cool and refreshing, with just enough to rock one to sleep in his hammock. The one great drawback to all our wanderings on the St. John's and its tributaries was our boat. It was too large for our purpose, and otherwise badly constructed. For days at a time we had to row and pull, and do everything that is hard, but after all, whenever we reached a choice spot, which was generally by turning into some tributary, we were doubly rep repaid for all our toil. So stealthily would we creep into those charming haunts of the feathered tribes, and so noiselessly and systematically did we prosecute our hunting, that all the wild things seemed to recognize us, if at all, some, uh, some other, as some other wild things bent, as it were, a day on procur procuring food simply. Caesar presided over our cuisine with marked ability, and in his way enjoyed the life to the full. His skill as a bird skinner I have never seen equaled, and in this alone, he more than saved us his wages and fare. If the reader will allow me for a moment to come squarely down to sordid considerations, I will just here add to our cruise that far from being an expensive one, resulted in net game, uh, gain of about $10. This was somewhat owing to the accidental exhibition at a Jacksonville hotel of a pair of heron skins, resulting to, in their sale to a New York man at an enormous price. He has been on having them and offered a sum that I was ashamed to take, as it was it was so large, but will in a very businesslike way close the trade and pocketed the money. How dreary a thing it is to come back to the humdrum and vexation of business life after four months of freedom, and all the charms of a wild camp in in such a region as Florida. For a time, one is restless and champs and champs at the bit, but is all for the best. 
and eight months will soon run by. They have run by again and again, and Will, have I, Will and I have drawn the bow on spots of Florida where never a white man fired a gun. Our steel arrowheads will be found embedded in the trees of the strange forests a hundred years from now. But to what good, you ask? What good? Is it a foolish question? Some men delight in Wall Street. What good? Some men travel in foreign lands. What good? Some delve at the desk or ran at the forum or dicker at the counter year in and year out. What good? It is all good. And thus ends chapter four. Some of the things that were done in the 18, late, 18, late 1800s, as this was published in 1879, would be considered horrible by today's standards. But that was 1879. Life was a different world, and things were done a little differently. There is a lot to be learned also from this book. So, enjoy as I read, finish reading it up in future episodes. Smash the subscribe button such as you would your fearsome foe.